Welcome to Flail Chest. So when we're looking at Flail Chest, this is usually the result of a trauma. And sometimes these are uh, traumas where someone falls down or someone gets crushed by something. Uh, they could happen in vehicle, motor vehicle accidents or uh, motorcycle accidents as well. Um, but this is usually some sort of like crush injury. And remember with Flail Chest, uh, the definition is at least a double break in three consecutive ribs. So this is what you're looking at on the screen. You see that rib cage and there's a double break in three consecutive ribs. And what happens is with your normal tidal volume breathing, just normal tidal volume breathing, that means that as the rib cage tries to expand, the rest of the rib cage is creating negative pleural pressure. So in those areas where there's the double break in those three consecutive ribs, that area is unstable. It will not expand with the rest of the chest wall. And in fact, as that chest wall expands, as the rib cage moves out, that area, because the thoracic pressure in the pleural space is becoming negative, will get sucked in. So the rib cage will move out, and then the areas that have that double break will get sucked in. So that area of the lung will actually get crushed. That area will become atelectatic because it'll collapse in that double break area. So as the chest wall expands, as the rib cage expands for a person to breathe in, you'll see the area with the double breaks uh, cave in like pectus excavatum. It'll just cave in and that actually compresses lung tissue and restricts lung expansion. So uh, when we're looking at this, that creates more work of breathing because then they don't have as much tissue being involved in breathing. Uh, so flail chest by definition is a double break in three consecutive ribs. So hopefully uh, this picture sort of helps you remember double break, three consecutive ribs. That's the main point to take away with this. Now, sometimes you may be able to see this at the bedside and I have little animations where you could sort of see what it looks like on a patient assessment. And sometimes you may not be able to pick it out at the bedside. They might be breathing really shallow and not generating a lot of pleural pressure to actually see that um, excavatum, that caving in during breathing. So sometimes you might just notice it on a chest x-ray um, or CT scan as well. So let's get into this. All right, alterations that go along with flail chest, it's the result of double fractures of at least three or more ribs, right? It can be more than three, but that's the minimum is three consecutive ribs, right? Uh, adjacent ribs or consecutive ribs, right? Either way, uh, double breaks, the big thing is the double break. If it's just a single break, uh, it's not gonna really cause the flail chest part. It's gotta be that double break. So usually these are pretty traumatic uh, situations. Very rare that this could happen spontaneously. I'm not aware of a case out there that uh, flail chest has happened spontaneously. Uh, unless someone had severe osteoporosis or something like that, but that's a whole separate thing. Uh, the rib cage, what happens here in this is the rib cage is very unstable and it'll move in an opposite pattern to the respiratory cycle. Remember, as you inhale, the rib cage expands, right? It gets larger. Well, this area of the double breaks will actually be sucked in, so it'll go the opposite direction during the respiratory cycle. So as the rest of the rib cage moves out, that area will move in. So what do you think will happen as the patient exhales? Well, as the rib cage gets smaller, remember alveolar pressure becomes now positive, and as the patient exhales and the rib cage is getting smaller, that little broken area will actually protrude. So it's this weird seesaw action where you have one area going out, one area going in, and then the reverse is true, right? Depending on the part of the respiratory cycle. So I have a video later on, if this is still not making sense in your brain, that's okay. Uh, when you're looking at this, uh, so you just sort of see the opposite uh, pattern that see they call it seesaw, right? That seesaw pattern when you're looking at this type of situation. So the area that breaks will be sucked in during the inhale, right? That's that negative response because of negative pressure breathing. Uh, so we're assuming that they're not on positive pressure ventilation right now, okay? 
Uh, when this happens, when the patient's inhaling and the rib cage is moving out and then that area gets sucked in, it actually compresses the lung. And so that's what we're seeing here is that lung compression that's causing things like atelectasis and impeding of uh, ventilation overall. In severe cases, this can be life-threatening. And the big thing here is to apply medical intervention if it's severe enough. Uh, this will lead to atelectasis. What type of atelectasis will this lead to? Hopefully you said compression, right? It's compressing, it's squishing that lung tissue. And anything that squishes the lung tissue, right? Uh, like a massive pleural fusion or a big bear hug, right? Anything that squishes that tissue is going to be compression atelectasis, right? Now, the other thing that can go along with this pretty easily is alveolar hemorrhage, right? The, 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 the alveoli itself will pretty much be bruised or contused and start bleeding and blood will flow into the respiratory zone, which will, of course, impede oxygenation and ventilation of course so this is a shunt like disorder and we'll get into this but uh, especially when we're looking at uh, pretty much a contused lung or bruised lung right we're looking at blood just flowing into that area and making it almost impossible for not only it to be crushed by the physiology of the injury but also uh, not be able to expand much because now we're filling it with blood it's pretty bad stuff all right, so this is a picture from your book. Don't you love your book? Uh, so this is an area on that patient's right lung. You see, as the patient inhales, the rib cage is moving out. That's what those arrows on the left are showing. I see how it's marked inspiration. See all these arrows that are showing as the, as the rib cage is moving out? <gasps> Gas is flowing into the lung. Now, what do you notice? Just like we talked about with pneumothorax and pendulu, the gas goes the path of least resistance, so it'll go to the opposite side. So with flail chest, what might happen to their mediastinum, their tracheal deviation? What would happen? It would go the same direction as the injury or opposite direction of the injury. Hopefully you said the opposite direction of the injury, right? It gets pushed away. If it's outside the lung, it gets pushed away, right? So this person, you might see tracheal deviation to the left if they have that right-sided, if it was a severe enough injury. So what's pendulof again? Hopefully you guys remember that from the pneumothorax lecture. Uh, pendulof is that moving of gas back and forth, just like the pendulum of a grandfather clock, right? Just that moving back and forth instead of the gas moving up it and out or down and in, right? So what happens with pendulof is gas flow will go into that one lung, let's say in this scenario, it goes into this patient's left lung. And when they go to exhale, and if you look at exhalation over here on the right side of the screen, as you see, instead of that CO2 going up and out, some of it will, but some of it will cross wash and go into the other lung. Right. And so this is a very bad situation because now we're causing CO2 retention. OK, we have CO2 retention, which means there's less parking spaces for oxygen in your lungs, which means there's less par parking spaces for oxygen in your bloodstream, so on and so forth. Right. So this patient can get hypercarbic and hypoxic very quickly very 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 quickly so that's what can make this a pretty dangerous situation overall uh, so when you see this that's that pendulift is that side to side like the pendulum of a clock right moving side to side instead of going up and out or down and in right and so that's not a good situation whatsoever so as the patient inhales please get this right please try to separate these two in your brain. I might ask you which direction the uh, affected area moves during inhalation. Well, if the patient's inhaling, then the area that's broken will also go in. That's how I remembered it. If the patient's exhaling, E is exit, right? If they're exhaling, then that area will go out. It will, ex it will exceed the chest wall. It will go out. Um, so I might ask you the area that's affected, what would happen during inhalation, during spontaneous breathing. So that's assuming they're not on positive pressure ventilation. So during spontaneous breathing, inhalation, the area that's affected would go in. 
On exhalation, during spontaneous breathing, the area that's affected would go out. It would go external. It would move out. Um, so remember, this is just the opposite movement of the chest. Well, I know it's confusing, and pendulum is just one of those things that's just telling you that this can lead to CO2 retention and poor oxygenation overall, which is what can make this pretty serious. Now, there's lung contusion as well. Remember, the alveoli are just filling up with blood and so that's going to make it harder to actually diffuse oxygen both into your bloodstream as well as get co2 out of your bloodstream so we have this whole issue where we have perfusion going through the lungs but it's not exchanging gas so this is a shunt pathophysiology so this patient may require higher FiO2s and possibly assisted ventilation depending on their pH and everything there so let's get into this all right alterations double fracture in numerous adjacent ribs remember you have to have at least a minimum of three right this causes a lot of rib instability it's going to restrict the lung from expanding right remember that area that's affected is getting sucked in and crushed during inhalation so it's going to restrict lung expansion so this is a restrictive disorder altogether of course when the lung gets restricted that leads to atelectasis that collapse right uh, lung collapse can easily happen in this scenario, as well as something called a pneumothorax, right? And hopefully you already watched that pneumothorax lecture. If you haven't, go watch it. Uh, the pneumothorax uh, can easily happen, especially if there's a pokey rib that's broken uh, and the patient's inhale and exhaling, uh, they could easily have a punctured lung with this whole situation as well. Uh, and it can cause a very serious condition very, very quickly. All right, and I had that whole story from when I was in high school and that kid had that situation happen on the field. Thank goodness for um, the paramedics that were at that game. Thank goodness. Um, so when we're looking at this, these patients may or may not have a pneumothorax. It is not guaranteed that they will have a pneumothorax. Just understand that that is something to consider or have sort of in the back of your mind when you're looking at these type of trauma patients. Is it possible, especially let's say we do intubate them and put them on a ventilator, if it's very hard to bag them, it's very hard to deliver the breath, the harder it is, the more likely there is that restriction is pretty bad. So that, that restriction could either be from the flail chest itself and or there could be pneumothorax involvement as well. So these are things you just got to be cognizant of when you're seeing these trauma victims. Lung contusion, very, very common with these patients. That's what causes that alveolar hemorrhaging, right? You have that, it's that bruising and then that blood just sort of builds and leaks into that respiratory zone. So obviously that's not good because what happens to your surfactant? Well, your surfactant gets diluted and it's contused and you're full of blood in the respiratory zone. So you're not going to be able to diffuse gas very easily or move gas very easily. And that area is very prone to being alectatic and shut down now that there's blood that's diluting the surfactant. So there's a lot of things going on in the respiratory zone here. So like I said, lung contusion, very, very common for these patients. And in fact, it's very normal for your clinical simulation on your board exams to have at least a trauma victim. Every year that I took the clin sims, uh, for fun, I didn't have to take it, but um, when, when I would take it, they would always give you, even when I took it the first time as a brand new grad, uh, they always give you the scenario of like a tree surgeon. Someone's up in a tree and they fall out of the tree and right, and then you're trying to rule out a pneumothorax or if they do have a pneumothorax, you want to treat it. Uh, and so you're looking at things like flail chest pneumothorax. So this is just something to look at, lung contusions. Even the adult critical care specialist exam looked at a lung contusion case and what that would mean for the lungs with alveolar hemorrhaging. So don't overlook uh, trauma to the lungs, especially if you're gonna be working at a trauma center and or looking at the board exams, whether it's just your basic RRT exam and or moving on to the adult critical care specialist exam, which I'm a big fan of the adult critical care specialist exam. I think that one is amazing. So that's a whole separate thing. Uh, secondarily, they can develop a pneumonia from this. So once this patient has flail chest, remember they have lung collapse, they have uh, atelectasis, they have all that blood that's filling up inside the respiratory zone of that affected area. So 
they have that going against them, so there's a lot. That area is going to be collapsed, closed down. But also, do you think that they might be in pain, especially if they have to cough or anything like that? Absolutely. So if you're in a lot of chest pain, are you going to want to take deep breaths and cough? Absolutely not, right? You're going to be like, this is the worst thing ever, right? It's going to be pretty bad. So these patients aren't taking deep breaths. They're not coughing. They already have this area that's atelectatic and collapsed and full of a bunch of bad stuff, cellular debris, right, from injury. And so that could easily lead to a post, uh, post-trauma post pneumonia. And so that's why a volume expansion therapy in these patients can be critical to preventing a pneumonia. And so that's something just to remember, right? If they order incentive spirometry or PEP therapy or some sort of thing that helps re-expand that tissue, it's very important that's gonna help them uh, be prophylactic against a pneumonia. All right, so let's put someone at risk for flail chest. Well, the big thing is going to be a blunt crushing injury to the chest. So this is not usually a stab victim type thing. This is a blunt crush injury, right? Uh, usually uh, a motor vehicle accident is where I've seen it the most uh, in my career. Uh, people will fall. This is especially with uh, p people that will fall off certain things, like from a ladder, <laughs> especially if they're a tree surgeon. Uh, they'll fall... Um, uh, you've got generationally advanced individuals that may fall and already have things like osteoporosis that may put them at higher risk for this. Uh, they might fall on ice, right? I had that happen a couple times where we were working in the dead of winter and someone would come in and they were shoveling and they slipped on ice and they broke a bunch of ribs. Um, so things like that. A blast injury, uh, that would be more for people that work in... Um, Level one trauma centers that you might see those blast injuries from. I'm not, I can't think of too many blast injuries I've seen, but especially if you work in the military or uh, in places that that's something that you could see. Uh, just understand if someone has a, some sort of blast injury, and I hope you guys never have to deal with that. But if you do, that's something that you should just be considered. Could they have flail chest slash pneumothorax going on? Um, obviously direct compression of a heavy object. I've had uh, people come in and I had one case that I can remember specifically where uh, it was this really tall bookcase that fell on this uh, young uh, this young person. So this guy was like maybe 11 years old, 10, 11 years old. Uh, and it fell on uh, this whole big giant bookcase fell on him and caused sort of that crushed crush injury so a heavy object um i did have another one where it was a construction worker and i guess some concrete wall fell on him as well and he did not quite he didn't have like the flail chest a textbook flail chest but uh, he did have double fractures and a couple of ribs but it wasn't causing the flail chest uh, it wasn't uh, at least three consecutive ribs. They were sort of spread out a little bit there. So crushing of a heavy, heavy object can easily do it as well. Uh, so therefore, uh, occupational and industrial accidents, that's something just to be aware of. <laughs> uh, in general, that's if you're working in a trauma center, and then that's what they came in uh, for is a trauma. Trauma alert, they come in and they have something like this. Uh, that Just be aware that flail chest could be in the back of your mind. Well, what would this mean to you? Well, this is a shunt-like process, so we're going to be using F502. We're going to be obviously trying to figure out ways to improve their VQ match and make sure that they're not hypoventilating. All right, so what would you see at the bedside? Well, obviously, this is not going to be painless, right? Uh, pain and anxiety are going to be very, very common on these patients, which that in itself can lead to hypertension and tachycardia. Uh, so you will see that very, very common on these patients. The hypertension and tachycardia are a sympathetic response as well. But also remember, we have with this cyanosis, which cyanosis itself can cause hypertension, and tachycardia. So there's a couple of things going on. Even if we give this patient really, really good pain control, or really adequate pain control, I should say, uh, they still might have tachycardia and hypertension if there's still hypoxemia going on. Remember, the brain stem will get the signal that the brain's not getting enough oxygen, and then it's going to tell the body to breathe faster, and it's going to tell your body to get more blood through your lungs so that way you can pick up more oxygen, right? That's where that tachycardia and hypertension comes in there. Uh, breath sounds are going to be diminished bilateral. 
Uh, why diminished? Well, is this obstructive or restrictive, right? It's, it's restrictive because it's not letting the tissue expand. So you're not going to hear a lot of tissue moving with the breath sound. So they're going to be uh, diminished. You might hear it bilaterally, especially if there's, I'll give you a hint, begins with a P. Right? If there's pendulous going on, where the gas is going from side to side instead of up and out, right? Still, some may be going up and out and down and in, but if the gas is going side to side uh, and just going from the one lung to the other lung instead of going up and out, then that's that pendulous going on, and that's why it might be bilateral, okay? So it might not just be unilateral, it might be bilateral, right? That's that sign that that pendulous is going on, right? There, what it is. Uh, lung compliance. Uh, yes, I know. I love talking about lung compliance because especially when you start looking at putting these people, if they have their CO2 is high enough, they're in acidotic, they're hypoxic, we might have to put them on a ventilator. Well, you're going to need to know that this disease causes their lung compliance to be altered from normal, right? So their lung compliance will be lower, which means if I give them a normal tidal volume, I put them, I, we intubate them, we put them on a ventilator, and I plug in a normal tidal volume for their their um, for their size, that actually might be doing them harm or damage because their compliance is low. It's going to take a lot of pressure to open up those lungs. And do I want to use too much pressure? No, because remember, if I use too much pressure with mechanical ventilation, especially on the inside, I can cause a hole to develop and cause a pneumothorax, right? Yay, no. No, don't do that, right? So it's important to know with these disease process, what can happen to their lung compliance? So if you have a person come in with a pneumothorax or a flail chest, you know not to go heavy on their tidal volume. You know to go light on their tidal volume, right? Use the lower end of a normal tidal volume for them, right? We don't want to cause any worse injury, right? What's that Hippocratic Oath, right? First, do no harm, right? There you go. Take it. Do it, follow it, all right? All right, what would this look like on x-ray? So like I said, um, it may not be clear on x-ray. It may not be clear at the bedside. So chest x-ray might be a more definitive way, especially to see double fractures, right? Uh, it might be very hard to see double fractures at the bedside. So in x-ray, uh, you're going to see a lot more opacity in the allotactic area or the affected area. And then this also tends to linger, uh, especially when they develop a post-flail pneumonia, right? That's where we don't do the volume expansion therapy. That's where they don't participate in PEP therapy. They don't participate in moving around. They, they hypoventilate because they're in too much pain, right? They develop that pneumonia and that allotactic Gary is going to be radiopaque, and especially if they develop a, that pneumonia, that you're going to see it there. Uh, rib fractures, you might need what's called a rib series on the x-ray. Uh, so that's where the, the x-ray underpenetrates. So it's going to be AP, so it's a, la it's a portable x-ray where they, they bring the x-ray machine into the room. And they say, everybody out, right? Um, and so they take the x-ray. They're going to make the x-rays, instead of penetrating all the way through, like you see with your traditional x-ray, where you just seeing the posterior ribs and the lung field, they're going to make it under-penetrate. So they're going to give it a little bit less umph. And so that will hey, you'll see the ribs a little bit easier. So that way you can have a better chance at diagnosing them with those double fractures of at least three consecutive ribs, right? So it's called a rib series. So if you see that out there, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a crush, and usually this is of anterior ribs. It's very rare that this would be posterior ribs, but uh, that's what they're looking for is those anterior ribs to show up on the x-ray. Uh, the compression atelectasis, uh, the density is going to be higher in that area that's affected by the injury um, overall. You also might see the rib fractures, especially if they did a rib series on the x-ray. Okay, so I believe I took this one directly from your book, right? This is a chest x-ray of a 20-year-old 20, 20 female with severe right-sided uh, flail chest, right? And you can see how that area on her right lung, if you're looking at letter A, is look at that right lung. Do you see good expansion? Do you see a good costophrenic angle over there? Right, you do not, right? Look at her left lung. If you see her left lung, 
good CP angle, right? You could see a good McDonald's arch in that one there, right? Really good arch. And so when we're looking at this, that right side is has a lower lung volume, hence restrictive disorder, right? And then you see that uh, you have more radio opacities, especially in that right lower lobe. So this whole area down here, right middle lobe and right lower lobe, is just almost airless, right? And so that's what we're looking at here is we have a lot more um, collapse of tissue. And that's not even in the affected area. That's in the affected side, but not in the affected area. Because remember, are we able to pull a lot of gas into the right lung with the LHS? No. So if this lady has a pneumothorax on, or sorry, a flail chest on her right side. Remember the whole pendulum thing? The gas will always go the path of least resistance. So it's going, most of that gas is going to her left lung and hardly any gas is going to her right lung. So is it possible then that her right lower lobe, even though it doesn't have the fractures, doesn't have the crushing, could be affected by this injury, absolutely. So hopefully you guys can see that, because remember, gas flow is the path of least resistance. And even when you look at her apices, so look at the apices on the right lung and the, the left lung, right? This left lung, very radiolucent, right? You see how much darker that left upper lobe is compared to the, her right upper lobe. And that's what you're seeing here is that extra gas is going to the left side. And so that whole area is being hyperinflated in some ways. Also, what do you notice about her cardiac structure in this x-ray? Does it look midline, slightly to the left where it's supposed to be, or to the right? Right, it's actually hard to tell, and I did this, this is a fun x-ray. Look at her collarbones. Are they even, or is one side higher than the other side? Right, her left collarbone is higher than her right collarbone. So this actually shows rotation. So the, the heart actually looks like it's more at midline than it actually is because the rotation of the patient. So this is where you get into the art of reading an x-ray or reading x-rays over time, you'll eventually get this. But one of the things that you're supposed to look for when you're reading an x-ray is collarbone symmetry. So if the collarbones aren't lined up, if I can't draw a direct straight linear line across, right, then I know that this patient is rotated and therefore can affect what side the heart is on or what, you know, the mediastinum and all the tracheal deviation and all that stuff. So I cannot say that her, her midline is, is moved at all because there is rotation on the x-ray. So there's just real world limitation there. And so hopefully you sort of get that you should just down the road be looking for symmetry, right? They should go straight across. If they don't, that's a sign there's rotation. So her left lung is actually closer um, in view than her right lung. And so therefore we can see more of her left lung too. So that's what makes it a little interesting. Now over here on letter B, if you're looking to the right where I haven't drawn anything yet, those purple arrows and the black arrow, they're all looking at the same x-ray and then they're just showing the rib fractures, right? They're showing where the ribs are busted um, on these patients. So that can cause a lot of issues there. So you're gonna have that, that atelectasis, that compression atelectasis in the right upper lobe. And of course you've seen her right lower lobe is atelectatic as well. Because remember pendulum, that gas is gonna flow the path of least resistance the opposite side. When she exhales, it's gonna cross wash and go into the right side instead of going up and out. So that means she could also have CO2 retention with this. Hopefully these x-rays with all these disease conditions is helpful to you. I sort of want to get you on a path to where you actually enjoy and want to look at your patient's x-rays to help you get a better picture of what's going on and therapeutically what's needed, right? You see a lot of atelectasis on an x-ray. Would PEP therapy be adventitious for this person? Would airway clearance be adventitious for this person, right? Would, right? This is where you're looking at all these things that might actually help you be more uh, of a better bedside practitioner as well as a better um, part of this team. 
All right, so PFT on this person. Now, we're not talking about this patient has massive flail chest. They're in the ER. They have three-word dyspnea. They're in severe pain, and you're going to do a PFT on them, right? Would anybody that's in severe pain, having poor saturation, tachycardia, tachypnea, all these bad things, comply with a PFT? Very rarely, I would think. <laughs> that's just me guessing. I, I don't know. Uh, I never tried it. But uh, this is looking at a PFT on a person sort of post-flail chest. So they've had flail chest, they're being, they've been treated, and you're doing to see if there's residual lung effects from the flail chest injury. Okay, so now we're doing a PFT post-injury, not directly during the injury, but post-injury, uh, to determine the, the or to, to quantify the level of impairment from the injury. And so what would you see on their volumes and capacities? Well, of course, this is a restrictive disorder, right? And so then, therefore, you would see the volumes, right? And that's what you're looking at here. Hence the atelectasis and all that stuff. So remember with these guys, you're not going to be on the heavy side of their tidal volume range if you have to put them on a ventilator. You're going to be sore on that light side of it. All right, ABG. So this is more realistic. Person comes into the ER, three-word dyspnea, crush injury, right? How severe is their condition overall? You want to see how bad their CO2 is or how bad their oxygenation is. This is the gold standard, right? The arterial blood gas. So if it's very mild, moderate in their disease condition, you're going to see a respiratory alkalosis, right? If it's a severe play flail chest, you're going to see an acute respiratory acidosis, right? And so those are the basic uh, physiology, remember, because you have an increase in your respiratory rate and you also have an increase in your heart rate, right? And so because you're breathing fast, you're breathing um, fast, you're going to initially go into that respiratory alkalosis. Uh, and that's going to be a sign that this patient's early on or they have a m very mild um, very mild injury so far. Uh, still, you don't want this person to go into respiratory fatigue or failure, so you still want to support and assist them as indicated. But uh, this sort of tells you the level of severity uh, at the bedside, in the ER, right? You're wearing your PEMA scrubs, PEMA stethoscope, patient comes in, breathing, hardly a couple words, severe pain, right? You're going to draw blood gas, and if you might see that alkalosis, that's a sign that this is sort of in that mild to moderate stage instead of that respiratory acidosis, which would be severe, you might have to go ahead and get ready for assisted ventilation. All right, oxygenation. We already talked about this being a shunt-like process. Remember, a shunt, by definition, is perfusion without ventilation. Uh, so this is what's going on here. We're not able to ventilate that area because it's crushed. It's filled with a bunch of um, blood bunch of bad stuff's going on. It's it's collapsed in on itself. So therefore your DO2 is going to be decreased. Remember DO2 is decreased because your CCO2 is decreased. Therefore your CAO2 is going to be decreased. Therefore your DO2 these are all downstream effects is going to be decreased, right? This is decreased because your CCO2 started it, right? You're not able to get oxygen into your pulmonary capillaries, and therefore the downstream effect was a decreased delivery of oxygen. Uh, VO2 and A to V gradient, uh, these can be normal or high, depending on how severe the case is. So if your patient's very severe and they're in a respiratory acidosis, and moderate hypoxemia uh, or worse, right? Remember, with hypoxemia, if it goes on long enough, your tissues start to produce lactic acid, right? And so what happens to your metabolic rate under a lactic acidosis, right? Does it increase or decrease? <laughs> yeah, it increases. That's supposed to be an up arrow. I'm going to have to go to art school eventually. Uh, so that's an up there. So your metabolic rate can be increased, your A to V gradient and your VO2, uh, depending on how severe their case is, especially their A to V gradient, if their DO2 is extremely low, then that's going to increase it as well, right? O2ER is going to be increased. The variables there can either be 
the the severity of their metabolic rate with the condition condition and remember that's also increased because their do2 is decreased All right remember me drawing this whole thing my normal metabolic rate so my metabolic rate is 5 and I'm delivering 20 right I have a lot left over my extraction ratio is normal here and then over here I take it down to my do2 is much lower I still taking the same amount out and now I have a higher extraction ratio just because my do2 is lower just because my delivery is lower right so the 20 and the 10 represents do2 in the situation the 5 represents metabolic rate so if your metabolic rate is normal and our do2 decreases we're going to have a higher o2er here's the danger so now we got this o2er that's increased because of a metabolic acidosis so now let's say i have a do2 of 10 right cross this stuff out i have a do2 of 10 right and then all of a sudden my o2er increases i have a higher metabolic rate i'm in a fight or flight response i'm in a sympathetic response and now let's say my extraction ratio is 10, right? I am pulling out all of the oxygen that is being delivered. I'm pulling out 100% of that oxygen that's being delivered to the tissue, right? My O2ER is 100% uh, or 1.0 if, if you do the fraction. My O2ER is very, very high. And so that means my venous saturation is going to be very, very low, right? Because there's nothing left over if I'm sampling from a, a central venous line, right? So be very cognizant. If you see a, a venous saturation that's very, very low, that could easily be a sign that their metabolic rate is high or they're in a lactic acidosis. All right, what happens with their right-sided heart pressures? What happens with their left-sided heart pressures? So let's start with the right-sided heart pressure. So uh, let's do right side. My CVP, right atrial pressure, my mean pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance, and my right ventricular stroke work index. All of these are increase so all my right-sided heart pressures are increased remember there's a lot of um, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that goes along with this so oxygen therapy is going to be indicated of course especially since it is a shunt like process all right so that's going to be therapeutic and helpful uh, assisted ventilation could be therapeutic and helpful because if we're getting rid of co2 in the pulmonary capillaries that will leave more room for oxygen therefore better uh, vasodilation therefore will decrease pvr which will decrease pulmonary artery pressure which will decrease right atrial pressure which will decrease central venous pressure right so we can see that that oxygen and assisted ventilation could be very helpful at relieving cardiac stress why do I care about cardiac stress on these patients? Well, is it possible that someone could have an underlying cardiac condition and go through a trauma like a car accident? Absolutely, right? Let's say your patient has core pulmonary baseline. Let's say your patient has congestive heart failure baseline. Let's say this person has had multiple cardiac uh, issues uh, as well. This is something where you want to also not only look at the lungs, but what can I do to take workload off of the heart, especially if I have a sick heart at baseline. And so this is going to be very useful to you in critical care medicine and emergency medicine and so on, right? So I am going to stress these hemodynamic screens. Hopefully they're starting to make more sense to you. All right. So we looked at the right side of the heart. We want to treat the right side of the heart pressures. So we want to figure out what's therapeutic, what will help the right side of the heart pressures go back down. We talked about ventilation, we talked about oxygenation, can all help support hemodynamics. And in fact, if someone has severe hemodynamic insufficiency, in other words, their blood pressure is super low or anything like that, that's actually an indication for mechanical ventilation separate of anything respiratory right because then we can actually be able to give the heart more oxygen we can be able to get rid of more co2 we can actually help the heart recover from whatever is going on with hemodynamic instability so just my little pedestal there you just had to deal with it but there you go i want you guys to sort of see the importance of this screen
All right, left side of heart pressure. So pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, how well the left ventricle is functioning, how much the blood squeezing on the left side uh, with cardiac output, stroke volume, the amount that's being squeezed, um, stroke volume index, cardiac index, left ventricular stroke work index, systemic vascular resistance. All my left-sided heart pressures are going to be decreased. Oh, heavens. So what does this mean for your patient? What does this mean to perfusing the tissues, right? We talked about the tissues and then your lungs, right? Your lungs are up here. Your tissues are down here. So what does this mean? If my left side of pressures are decreased, do I have a lot of oxygen being delivered to my tissues, AKA let's say my, car, my myocardium or my brain or my kidneys or right, you name it, I'm going to have low oxygen delivery because my left-sided heart pressures are so low. That means I have a higher chance of going into a metabolic acidosis or a lactic acidosis in this case, right? So these patients can become very unstable very quickly, right? Hopefully, you guys, I know I speak a lot on this screen, and this, if you understand these hemodynamic concepts, it will exponentially make you that much more valuable at the bedside. And I want you to get this. Even if you we don't put a swan in where we can read all these pressures, I want you to understand that with this condition, my right side of heart pressures are increased, my left side are decreased. That's why this patient's in a metabolic acidosis. That's why if I give them ventilation and oxygenation, it will help resolve their right side of heart pressures. It will actually help them perfuse their lungs and their kidneys more effectively and avoid, avoid multi-organ system failure, right? That's where I want you to get with this, right? Hopefully you see why I'm putting this in there. It is not a torture device. Okay, so here's that little animation I told you about. Um, when we're looking at diagnosing a flail chest, the chest x-ray, especially if you do a rib series, might be very, very helpful, if, especially if it's not obvious. Uh, bedside evaluation, so that's where we're looking at this little animation here. And you can see as the patient's breathing in, where the rib cage is moving out, it's supposed to be moving out it's except for this like area in here, right? That area in there, and you can see the contusion. You can see that blood and where the lacerations and all that stuff is, is just being sucked in and therefore crushing that area. The alveoli on this patient are getting filled with a bunch of blood. And so therefore you can see, and the patient's bagging, right? Uh, they're bagging the patient. You can see this hand squeezing um, the patient. So this pa patient is being, is intubated. Um, so you can sort of see this at the bedside that this is a true flail chest. So that's one of the things that they could see at the bedside here. Notice um, this is the patient's hand over here. Does that look darker than it should be? Absolutely. Because what do you think happened with their hemodynamics? Right? Even though it might say hypertension, right? Their blood flow to their tissues is going to be hypoxic, which means are they going to be bright pink? Right? Are they going to have that good, strong, rich blood flow color? Or are they going to be sort of that darker, uh, hypoxic, cyanotic? Right? That's what you're seeing there. <laughs> Big difference, especially. Uh, CT scan can even be more helpful. CT it, it is an x-ray that is 3D, and we can see a lot more detail on CT scan. So odds are you'll do a trauma series with this patient, especially if you show up in the ER. Uh, they'll take this patient to a CT where they'll do the abdomen, chest, um, uh, abdomen, chest, and neck, especially on this person that's in C-spine precautions. You can see we're in the collar there. Um, just to make sure there's no bleeding in the abdomen, things like that. It's our way to sort of rule out um, spinal cord injury, pulmonary injury, or see the extent of it as well, and avoid uh, uh, abdom avoid missing like an abdominal injury, things like that. So hopefully this animation is a little helpful to you to sort of visualize that area that's being sucked in, right? That what that compression atelectasis. Like Interventions, of course, with these patients, pain control can be very helpful. So this is a fine line. Uh, with pain control, if you give them too much pain control, obviously that will ca that can cause them to hypoventilate. If you give them too much pain control, right, that can cause them to hypoventilate. If you give them too little pain control, they're still in pain, and therefore they're going to breathe shallow and hypoventilate. 
hypoventilate. So either way, they'll hypoventilate whether it's too much or too little. And so there's that fine line in between there. So pain control is not necessarily a bad thing on these patients as long as it's done to a happy medium where they're not in as much pain, but they're still not uh, knocking out their respiratory drive as well. Of course, oxygen therapy, we talked about this in the hemodynamic screen, uh, and with the Pendulif and with everything else going on, that's going to be a big benefit to your patient, especially with the right side heart pressure, left-sided, so on, and delivering more oxygen to the tissues and organs, right? Volume expansion therapy when they're stable, <laughs> right? If I tell you a patient shows up to the ER with a massive flail chest, uh, do you want to give them a PEP therapy treatment right away? Right? No. <laughs> no. Uh, this is when they're stable. This is sort of that post-initial injury, right? So what do we do to help avoid a post-flail uh, chest um, pneumonia, things like that? What do we do to re-expand that tissue? Uh, if they're on a ventilator or a positive pressure device, um, that PEEP, uh, if we give them that positive end expiratory pressure or that continuous positive airway pressure, right, if they're on non-invasive, that's going to help stabilize the thoracic wall because the lungs have that continuous inflation. We're not letting the rib cage close down as much during exhalation. So we're sort of keeping the rib cage stented open, right? We're, it's just like a cast that, that keeps a bone stable. We're pretty much using that PEEP or that CPAP to keep the rib cage as stable as possible to help avoid um, the, the crushing as well as um, pain in some of these patients. It's all about tolerance uh, when we're, we'll get down to that. All right, review questions on flail chest. Pretty straightforward. What are coming long alterations that occur with flail chest? What What is going on with the respiratory zone? What is going on? Uh, what's the definition of flail chest? Uh, at the bedside assessment, what might you see, right? What would happen with their breath sounds? What would happen with their heart rate? What would happen with their blood pressure? What would happen, so on and so forth, right? Uh, what would be, uh, what's significant about their x-rays? What are some x-ray things that you would see with this? Would you see hyperlucency or would you see radio opacity? Would you see uh, so on and so forth? What would you see on their x-ray? What are some signs that you would see on their x-ray? ABG if it was mild case, right? ABG if it was a severe case, what would you see? Oxygenation, tell me about this process. We know it's shunt like, but tell me what happens. Is, is there any change in their metabolic rate? Is there a change in their um, DO2? Is there a change in their O2ER? Is there a change in their venous saturation? If so, what direction did they go? All right, post initial injury, what would their PFT show? What type of condition is this? Restrictive, obstructive, both? Um, what would their PFT show with their volumes? What would their PFT show with their flow rates? All right, patient is spontaneously breathing. They're not on a ventilator. Which way does the area that's busted move during inhalation? Which way does it move when they're exhaling? Let me ask you this, what is Pendeloof and why do you care? All right, finally, what are some therapeutic interventions used for these patients that have flail chest? These are all things that I just want you to go through, right, to help you sort of grasp the concept. This is what I would see, this is what it would look like, this is how I determine the level of severity, and these are all how I determine what type of therapies I would recommend and or use for these patients.